Hi, my name is Mr. Mal and Higher Physics is my business. And in this YouTube Live special, we'll be taking a look at questions 5 to 10 of the 2016 multiple choice questions. So let's get down to business, watch the video, watch how the questions are done, take a few hints and notes, and you'll be ready for your revision and much more importantly, ready for your exam coming up in a few weeks time. So let's get down to business. Question six of the 2016 Higher Physics Multiple Choice is all about the Doppler effect. And it tells us here a car horn emits a sound with a constant frequency of 405 hertz. The car is travelling away from the student at 20 meters per second. You're given the speed of sound and you're asked to find the frequency of the sound heard by the student. Now the key diagram that you should have always in front of your mind when doing the Doppler effect is this diagram here. It sums up precisely what the Doppler effect is. Uh, for example, if you're standing here in the middle of the road, you will hear the car approaching you, the car going away from you. So you have the high frequency sound, and you have the low frequency sound, as the car moves away from you. You look up the data sheets, and you have the Doppler equation, but then you're left with the decision which am I going to, which part am I going to use, the plus or the minus part? Now, this is why you remember this diagram here, because the girl student here, the car is moving away from her, so she's going to hear the low frequency sound. And the low frequency sound can only be found out if you use a big denominator, which means you use the plus part of the denominator. And also, if the sound wave is, if the sound's coming towards you, you're going to hear the high frequency sound. So if you only have the low value here to give you the big F naught. So you're going to have to use a minus sign here. Now that might be quite a lot to remember and I remember the diagram simply by saying uh, the girl the girl in the car, the car is moving away from the girl, its distance is plusing, so therefore she will hear the plus part of the equation. The man here, the car is approaching him, the distance is minusing, so he's going to hear uh, the high frequency part, which is, means he'll be using the minus part of the equation. So we're dealing with the girl in this particular case, so the equation we're going to use is F0 equals Fs, the bracket V, V, and it's going to be the plus one, because she's going to have the low frequency, so it's a plus one. Now, like any other numerical question, you have to be organised, and that means writing out every part of the variables you're going to be using, deciding what you're going to find, and then working it out from the equation. So F0 is the observed frequency, which you're going to hear, the lady's going to hear, and that's got to be found, so question mark goes there. Frequency of the sound is going to be 405 hertz, so 405 hertz for there. The speed of sound is V, in this case it's 335 meters per second and the speed of the source that's the speed of the car is going to be 28 meters per second so we have 28 meters per second so all we've got to do is put in the numbers for this mark out what f naught is f naught equals 405 and the big brackets you're going to have v the speed of sound 335 divided by and 335 again plus 28. Now if you do that calculation, and you should be able to do it in your Casio calculator, you should get an answer uh, on your calculator 373.76 hertz. Now to three significant figures, that will be 374 hertz. So the answer to the first question uh, is going to be 374 is question B. Question seven is a difficult question because we have to understand what this graph is all about. The graph shows how the radiation per unit surface area, R, and it's given the units of it, varies with the wavelength lambda of the emitted radiation of two stars, P and Q. Now, before we launch into the question, a quick bit of revision on these graphs, which we call the black body graphs or the black body curves. You see, here we have one here taken from the PHET uh, physics site 
which is an amazing demonstration. And you can see we have a graph here, and it goes like that, wavelength, and this is the intensity, which is the amount of radiation given off uh, per meter squared for each wavelength, per wavelength. Now, what does that mean? It means just simply this. When we analyse this body, which is hot, and any hot body gives off radiation, if we analyse each wavelength of radiation and calculate how many photons come from it, we can work out the energy given off at each particular wavelength. And you can see in this body here, which is sitting at temperature 3855, we have a peak round about the red end of the spectrum. And it's not a particularly big profile, which means it's not giving off a lot of energy. Think of the area as the summation of all the energy. So even though it's a hot body of 3855 Kelvin, um, it's not giving off a lot of radiation. And the peak wavelength is at the red part. Now let's bump up the temperature a little bit to give us this graph here. Now as you can see, we increase the temperature to 5205 the peak wavelength moves towards the violet end of the spectrum, the small wavelength part of the spectrum, and it increases, which means it's given off a lot more radiation. And you can see also from the profile of that curve, the area of it is much bigger than the area of this one. So the body, as it gets hotter, it's given off more radiation, and its peak wavelength, which is given off the most radiation, is moving from the red end of the spectrum to the violet end of the spectrum. We can bump up the temperature a little bit more and see the difference again. So going from 5205 to 605, the peak is getting higher and the peak wavelength, the wavelength which is giving off the most energy, is shifting more towards the violet side. And the area of the graph is much bigger, which means it's giving off a lot more radiation. So hotter bodies give off a lot more radiation. So a couple of key points from this graph, uh, from the graphs, and is, is the following. The hotter the body, the more the peak wavelength moves towards the blue end of the spectrum. And that's a key point you have to remember. Now, the other key part here as well is... What does the graph actually tell us? These graphs tell us how much radiation is given off for each wavelength if we analyse the light coming from a hot body. So we'll measure the each wavelength and we count how much energy is given off from each individual wavelength and we make up this famous black body curve. So there are the two key points there. Now back to the question. The graphs show the radiation per unit surface area R varies with the wavelength lambda of the emitted radiation of, for two stars P and Q. Let's go through the student's statements. First of all, star P is hotter than star Q. Well, the answer there is definitely not, because you can see it's got a smaller peak radiation, and its area part is a lot smaller in here, so it's definitely not going to give off a lot more radiation. And remember, the hotter the star becomes, the wave, the peak wavelength moves towards the violet area, so therefore it's definitely the short wavelength area. So definitely star Q is hotter than star P, so that statement is wrong. Star P emits more radiation per unit surface area than star Q? No, because if you look at star P, it's got less area under the graph, so you add up all this graph, it's going to be less than star Q, so it's not going to give off more radiation per unit surface area, so that one's wrong. Which leaves us with this final statement, let's hope it's correct. The peak intensity of the radiation from star Q is at a shorter wavelength than that of star P. Well, that's correct because there is the wavelength, the peak wavelength for star Q, and we drop down a little line from that, we can see that the wavelength is there. And there is the wavelength from star P, and you can see that, in this case, the peak intensity radiation from star Q is at a shorter wavelength than at star P. So that statement is correct. So our answer to this question is three only. It's got to be C. Good question, and study those graphs. Question eight. 
is a standard question. One type of hadron consists of two down quarks and one up quark. And you ask to find the charge on a down quark is minus a third. The charge on up quark is plus two thirds. And you ask to give which is the combined charge and which type of hadron we're talking about. Now, here's the chart for this. You have to learn this basic fact here. Hadrons are particles made up of quarks. And they fall into two families. You have baryons, which are made up of three quarks. And you have mesons, which are made up of two quarks. And that's usually a quark and an antiquark. So a hadron made up of two different types of families. And you can learn those facts there. Now let's work out the total charge, which we're dealing with. Now this particular hadron is made up of two down quarks. So we have minus a third. For one of the quarks and we have minus a third for the other one two down quarks and an up quark of plus two thirds now we add all those charges together the minus third minus third gives us minus two thirds plus the two thirds is going to give us zero so we have a charge overall charge of zero and what family is what family does the uh, are we dealing with here well, it's three quarks, so it's got to be a baryon. So the answer for that one is number or letter A. Question nine is dealing again with the subnuclear particles, but this time with bosons. Now, what exactly is a boson? Well, a boson is the force, medium pa force mediating particle. And it can be summed up by this little uh, picture here of two boys throwing a ball at each other. The ball being thrown, you can consider that to be the boson. Because as long as these two boys throw this ball to each other, they will be locked together. They'll be forced together. And that's how we believe that forces uh, manifest themselves. It's the exchange of this particle called the boson. And for each type of force we have a different force-carrying particle. Now, that can be summarised up with this little division part here. Now, the electromagnetic force is mediated by a boson called the photon. The strong nuclear force is mediated by a boson which we call the gluon. And the weak force, which is the force responsible for radioactive decay, is mediated by these three types of bosons here, called W+, plus, W-, minus, and Z. Let's check. Correct. We've got them all right. Now, knowing that information, we can go back to the equation and see if we can get the correct statements. And here are the statements. A student makes uh, the following statements. The force-mediating particles are bosons. Well, that is correct. Gluons are the mediating particles of the strong force, and that's correct as well. Photons are the mediating particles of the electromagnetic force, and that is correct as well. So we'll get three correct statements, and that should give us uh, letter E for our answer. Question 10 has to do with a nuclear decay. Now, we quick recap on nuclear decay for you, first of all, or, or basic uh, nomenclature of a nucleus. Uh, here's a standard symbol for a nucleus. In this case, we're looking at lead, PB, and we're given two numbers, 208 and 82. The top number is the mass number. That is number of protons plus neutrons. The bottom number is the number of protons, which is called the atomic number. So in any nuclear reaction, the mass number, so the mass numbers on the left hand side of the reaction should equal the mass numbers on the right hand side. They should be conserved. So that's what we'll be looking out for in the equations we have above. And here we go then. We've got PQBI and a beta decay to give you polonium, but we're not given the mass numbers or the atomic numbers. And we're given the final nucleus after a beta and alpha decay. So we've got to work our way backwards in this question. And uh, most 
simplest way to do it, or the most organised way to do it, is to write out the equation. Now, when you write out the equation, uh, I'm going to do this one here. I'm going to do polonium, and it's going to decay into two particles. First of all, an alpha particle is going to be emitted, and an alpha particle is given the symbol for 2, it's a helium nucleus, plus the lead, which is there as well, 2 weights and 80. Two. Now, conservation of mass numbers and atomic numbers, if we've got 4 and 208 in this side, we must have 212 in that side. If we've got a 2 and an 82 in this side, we must have an 84 in that side. So right away we've got the answer to R and S, fill them in. R is 212 and S is 84. Can we get the answer right away? 212 and 84. No, we're down to these two bottom answers down here. So let's look at the second uh, reaction. That's going from polonium, from bismuth to polonium. And this is the situation we have here. Once again, I'm going to write out the decay uh, equation. So bismuth is going to decay. It's going to emit a beta particle. And a beta particle is a fast-moving electron, which is given that symbol here. Mass number zero, and atomic number minus one plus the nucleus it was changed into is polonium and we already worked that out polonium is going to give you 212 and it's got to be uh, 2284 so once again conservation of mass numbers 0 and 212 here so the mass number of bismuth must be 212 be careful here minus 184 is 83 so the atomic number of bismuth must be 83. So we now have P and Q. P is 212. And Q is 83. So take your time all these little equations. Work them out. Know what an alpha particle is. Know what a beta particle is. 212, 83, 212, 84. And it looks like it's going to be this one down here. Number D. And a tip for exam. Be organised. If you get a table like this, it can be very simple to be confused. Mark them out one after the other. So that ends question number 10. Well, that's your five questions from the 2016 multiple choice questions number 6 to 10. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you learned from them. Now go and study them. And thanks for watching.